So today we're going to do the handover video on this Burst and Eliseo TD745. We're going to start on the outside and then we're going to move on to the inside. So firstly, coming over to the passenger side, you'll notice that you've got your fill up points here with your diesel and also your add blue, which is just below. You'll, you'll need the ignition key just to unlock the diesel cap here um, so you can fill that up. And then the add blue has been topped up from factory and that will give you a warning symbol just on the dash when that is running low. Opening up the passenger side, you'll need to unlock using the key. Simply click the unlock button like so. That'll unlock your two front doors and your main habitation door. And opening that up, you can see that you've got tyre pressures on the door sill here, along with your bonnet release catch, which is just here. I released that to, uh, to just get underneath the bonnet. I'll show you there just in a minute. Um, but we've got on here Remis cab blinds fitted to the windows. You've got them on your side windows as well as your big window at the front. To operate this, all you need to do is simply pinch the clip, pull out like so, and slide the blind down until it meets and connects via the magnetic strip. Same goes for the front as well. They just connect via the magnetic strip, blacking out the entire cab, and then you're good to go. I typically find it's a lot easier if you lead from the bottom, just allowing them to fold up nice and neat and will just allow you to lock in. Sometimes if you pull them from the top, they can get caught and twisted, um, which can lead to them ripping. So just be quite delicate with them. As a rule of thumb with anything in a motorhome, if it feels like it's uh, being forced, you're probably doing something wrong. So just bear that in mind. Uh, just before I move underneath the bonnet as well, it's worth pointing out that underneath here, We've also got where all your fuses are located. So if the vehicle ever blows a fuse, you can just find them underneath here. And your leisure batteries are just located underneath the front driver's, um, uh, driver's seat. Just similar, just by popping that down, you can access them. And coming round underneath the bonnet, I'll lift that up for you now. So with the bonnet open, the main things that you know uh, you need to know underneath here is if you're ever going to jump start the vehicle. If you're going to do that, you've got your negative terminal, which is just below the sticker, as indicated here. And your positive terminal is just located underneath the cap here. A little bit difficult to show you on the video, but there's a cap here. Um, there's a plus sign on there, which indicates that that's where the positive terminal is. So positive onto there, negative onto here. And that will allow you to jump start the vehicle should you ever need to. Next to that, you've then got your engine oil, and above that, you've got your brake disc fluid, along with your engine coolant, and then finally, in the corner, you can see that you've got your washer fluid as well for your front windscreen. So moving on, uh, and to the side of the vehicle, you can see that you've got your main habitation door here. Now, we'll jump on the inside of the vehicle shortly. Um, you can see that this door does hold back and just connects into that piece of plastic there, which uh, allows it to stay put and above there you'll notice that you've got your full awning now i'm going to send you a separate video showing you how the awning works uh, as you can appreciate i've only the one hand to film this video so it's going to be a lot easier if i send you a separate video showing you how that works but there's two things to remember the main thing is if it is a windy day please take the awning in you should never really use the awning when it is a windy day because as you can imagine if you get a little bit of wind underneath that awning all that will happen is it will pull it from the vehicle potentially damaging your van and other vehicles on site because it's like having a massive sail on the side of the vehicle so if it's a windy day take the awning back in if it's rainy although the, the awning can be used in rain i'd recommend taking it in um because at a later date you are going to need to pull that awning out just to dry it you should never really keep the awning uh, soaking wet because after time it will um, it will uh, become obviously mouldy and it will just deteriorate the awning so just bear that in mind but as I say I will send you a separate video now next to the door in here you've got access to your external barbecue point and you can see just like that the external barbecue point is open uh, and can be used. You'll need a little nozzle that will connect into there, which can then connect and feed onto your pipe, which will then link to your barbecue. Now, of course, you will need your gas turned on for this to operate. So to turn the gas on at the bottle, which I will show you how to do when we move onto the inside, uh, sorry, the other side of the vehicle. But once you've done that and you've got everything connected, turn this uh, lever and that will pull all the gas through and then you're good to go. Now, directly below that, 
is another locker. Underneath here is uh, where your cassette toilet is actually located. And as you can see, with the cassette locker door open, it will gain you access to the cassette. So, so to remove the cassette, all you'll need to do is pull up on this orange lever and slide the cassette out towards you. Please bear in mind, you've got something called a blade on the toilet and that blade will close and open the cassette. If that blade is open, um, it will in essence be uh, connected to the cassette toilet. So every time you come to remove this, it could potentially pull that and break the float on the inside of the cassette. So please ensure that the blade is closed before removing this. Uh, now I'll show you how that blade operates when we move on to the inside of the vehicle, but it is in, it, it's really key to know that if this feels like it's getting jammed or stuck, don't continue to pull it because you'll ultimately just break it. Um, it should move freely when removing. So if it's getting jammed, chances are you've left that blade open. So go into the inside of the van and, and just close that which will allow you to remove this nice and easy. Now to empty this, it's dead easy. All you're gonna do, slide it out like so, and just pop it on the ground for the time being, and you've gotta simply pull out the funnel, remove the gray cap on the top, and using the orange button on the back, that will release an internal vacuum, which will allow you to empty the entire contents of the cassette. Once you've done that, you can put a bit of uh, water in here just to swill it out, and then if you're using blue fluid, you can take the cap off, there's a little measurement in there, pop the fluid in there, and then you can uh, put the, uh, put the uh, funnel, uh, sorry, put the cap back on the funnel, and then push that into position. Once you've done that, Pick this back up, that can then go back into uh, its slot. Now you will also notice there is this orange lever here which does turn. Uh, the blade that I mentioned earlier actually connects to this and again allows you to open and close the cassette. This should always stay in this position, there should be no need for you to turn that. If that is off slightly and you go to put the cassette in, again it will get jammed. So please ensure it stays like that. If you got it out in that way, just put it back in that way. It's as simple as that. So once you're ready, up it goes, simply line it up with the slot and push all the way in until the handle just slots into position there so it's ready for when you're travelling. Next to that you'll notice that you've got uh, another uh, flap here which underneath has point for a socket which is a 230 volt socket. Now you will need a uh, adapter which will just connect into there, which will convert it from uh, 12 pin to, uh, uh, two pin rather, to 230 volt. And you will also notice you've got aerial points here. If you'd like, we can, uh, you can actually wire that up to your external, uh, your, in, your external aerial if you've had one fitted, uh, but we very rarely do. Uh, but that can be wired up in that way. Moving to the, bit, uh, the back of the vehicle, you'll notice that you've got your garage. And in the garage, you've got your carpets, as you can see. You've also got your inflation kits here. Uh, and as well, this bit vehicle has got a bike rack on the back. There's some spare arms um, for any additional bikes you'd want to add. On the rear wall, you've also got an awning pole for the awning. And you'll also notice uh, that you've got another winder here. This particular motorhome is fitted with rear steadies, as you can see. They are just located there. Then you can quite simply see how they just connect onto this nut here and then you can wind the rear steadies down just to give it a little bit more rigidity when on the inside of the motorhome. At the rear there on the other side you've got your jack and you'll also notice you've got some safety chocks as well. Located on the right hand side you've also got a socket so if you're charging any items in the back you've got a 230 volt plug and also a heater here which will heat this entire area. Finally, in here you have got some uh, tie down points which you can simply unscrew and move around the garage and you can connect a bungee cord to them to get them into position. Moving to the rear of the vehicle, as I mentioned, this particular motorhome has been specified with a bike rack which is all ready to go and you've got just up at the top a reversing camera which is just there. Moving to the other side of the motorhome, you can see you've got another access point into the garage along with your two fridge vents which are up next. Now this is where the fridge pulls all of its air from, so as you can imagine, if this side is beating down with sun, um, the fridge isn't really gonna work or perform as efficiently as you'd want it to. So with that in mind, if it is a very sunny day, quite a hot day it is today, 
try and keep this area under shade that will just allow the fridge to run a little bit more efficiently now you can buy covers for these just winter covers they snap onto here for when you're storing the motor home during the colder months uh, you can see they just snap on like i mentioned onto these areas here underneath that you've then got your 230 volt plug-in point you can see we're hooked it up at the moment and that will gain you uh, 230 volt in the vehicle so that will charge your leisure battery up and it will also provide you 230 volt power allowing you to use your 230 volt sockets throughout the motorhome next to that you've then got your gas locker which i'll open up for you now and with the gas locker open you can see you've got space for two 11 kg gas bottles they can be hooked up um, or secured into place rather uh, with these uh, uh, these uh, straps and you'll notice once your uh, uh, bottles are in you'll just need a pigtail which will lead from the bottle into the gas regulator up at the top now this particular um, vehicle has been specified uh, with a switch changeover valve all you need to do is turn it depending on which gas bottle you want the gas to come out of so if you've got a gas bottle here you can see there's a little arrow up here so turn that arrow towards that bottle that will then feed out and vice versa if you've got a bottle over here just turn that and then that will allow it to feed out so it just saves you from having to obviously unclip your bottle and, and, and attach it to another underneath here as well you've also got um, the ability in this particular motorhome to turn on and off the gas on the inside of the vehicle which i'll show you how to do it's dead easy uh, and really simple the main thing that you do need to know about the gas however is to always ensure that when you're traveling your gas is turned off although this is uh, fitted with a crash sensor uh, which will shut off the gas when traveling if involved in a collision that does not stop any gas that's remaining in the pipes so i'd always advise when traveling turn the gas off simply at the bottle just by turning that that will seal up the bottle and then you're good uh, for transit when you're on site of course turn them bottles on and then you're good to use them so moving on from the gas locker you can see that we've got your external shower point so you'll have a gas hose that will uh, sorry gas hose a shower hose rather um, which will prov be provided with the vehicle that will just connect into this fitment here you of course need your pump on on the inside of the vehicle for this to operate you can then switch this external pump on and then decide between hot and cold on the shower head you'll have a little lever that you can push in and that will activate and allow the water to flow through and they're really good and of course that will pull from your fresh water tank which we'll get onto shortly so moving on from the shower you've then got your truma uh, vent which is just here so this is basically the vehicle's chimney can be get quite hot that to so just give it a little bit of a wide berth and then next to that you've got your convenience locker so within the convenience locker you've got your fresh water tank along with your fresh drain down water you've then got your boiler drain down point which is linked clearly to the boiler and then you've got your drain down point which drains everything from the boiler beyond so you've got where uh, you've got the majority uh, of the drain down points and also fill up points located in one spot so it's nice and easy so firstly you can see that your fresh water tank as indicated by the sticker will take 120 litres of fresh water uh, all you've got to do to fill this up is unscrew this blue uh, cap here now somewhere in the vehicle i'm not located it yet but you will have an overspill cap that overspill cap will slot onto there it's just a black uh, flap almost and then you can fill this up using a food grade hose pipe now i'd recommend a food grade hose pipe and not uh, a normal hose pipe just because that will ensure that there's no bacteria build up in the pipe now although i would recommend a food grade hose pipe i don't recommend drinking out of uh, the tank directly i think if you're drinking out the tank uh, you're better to take bottled water obviously you're all right if you're boiling the water and washing with the water but i wouldn't recommend drinking directly out of the tank but like i mentioned filling it up just ensure that you use a food grade hose pipe you can fill that up and then you're good to go now underneath you'll also notice there's a big red cap you can remove this this is if you're ever going to clean out the tank now just for the reasons i've mentioned you don't really need to clean it out that often um, because 
as I mentioned, if you've uh, if you're not drinking out the tank, it's not it's not key because all that's going to go in here is fresh water. Um, so with that in mind, you don't really need to clean out once a year will do, uh, and you can also use, uh, buy purifying tablets will, that will just go in the top here and purify the tank. Now to drain down the fresh water tank, you've got two options. So you've got this little black lever up at the top. Turn that to drain it down. And there's two settings on this. So if I turn it all the way back, so at the moment it is now sealed. To drain it down, you turn it and then you reach a little lug. I don't know whether you can hear that. If, that, if you heard that little click, that's a little lug that's in the pipe. What that will do is if you drain up until that click, before it clicks, that will drain the entire fresh water tank down to 20 litres. And it's a quick drain down point. It's designed for if you're traveling with water due to weight and di uh, distribution and payload, the manufacturer recommend you only travel with 20 litres of water. So that will allow you to drain the entire 120 litres out just to 20. Uh, it's really designed for if you're moving off site and you want to keep a bit of water in the tank for, for your next destination, you can do so nice and easily. Now, if you want to drain the entire thing down, all you've got to do is keep turning the valve up until the point it stops, past that lug, and like I mentioned, that will drain everything down. Now, on your site, you'll have a big grid that you can drive over. Drive over that line all of your drain down points up and simply turn that valve and that will allow you to empty and dump all of your tanks. And this goes for every single um, drain down point. You've got your fresh water, your boiler drain down and your waste, which we're gonna to get to. And that goes for them all. You should never really travel with um, a vehicle with that's full of water. So drain it down before you go. And like I say, on site, you'll have a big grid that you can drive over and you can empty all of them tanks out into that grid. Once you've drained down the majority of water on site, you can leave all your tanks open because the as you're traveling, that, that vibrations from the road uh, will just ensure that all that residual water makes its way out of the tank. Now, next to that, you've got your boiler drain down point. And as I say, there's actually two linked to this, but your main drain down point for your boiler is actually this um, piece of plastic here. So this is your frost protection valve. To drain, uh, sorry, to uh, seal this unit, all you've got to do is turn the diamond on top so the diamond is facing towards you and the black little nib is uh, located on the inside and then press the blue tab in on the side like so, so it's flush. That unit is then sealed and you're good to use it. Of course, make sure that that yellow tap is flicked down, that will seal it, and up is to drain it. And like I say, that drains everything from the boiler beyond. So I'll keep that down for the demonstration purposes. Um, now, if you want to drain it down, the boiler, all you've got to do is simply turn that. And just like that, that has turned the nib has come back up and that blue tab has popped out on the side and that will then drain down your boiler. And then to drain everything beyond the boiler, flick that yellow tab up. Now, the reason this is called a frost protection valve, it's designed as a fail safe. So this actually reacts to temperature. So for example, if you're using the vehicle in really cool conditions and you're then, uh, you're, you've gone to store the vehicle and you forgot to drain down the tank, what will happen is this will react to temperature and it will automatically trip and drain down the tank. It'll do that if it reaches a certain temperature. Now what can happen is if you've not used the vehicle in a while and you come to fill this tank up, you'll go to turn this lever and then you'll go to press the blue button in on the side and what will probably happen is that will keep pinging out. So instead of laying flush as it is, that will keep pinging out. The reason for it is like I mentioned, as that reacts to temperature, what's off, what, what it will be doing is it will be protecting itself because it'll be too cold for that to seal. If that happens, you just need to jump on the inside of the vehicle, turn your heating on, which I'll show you how to do shortly, and uh, just allow this area to get nice and warm. After about 30 minutes, this area will be nice and warm. You can then press that button in and seal the system and then you're good to go. Now, a lot of people worry that that's gonna then trip on them if they're using the vehicle, but don't worry. This will only trip 
if it's absolutely freezing the vehicle, which it's not going to be because you're going to be living in the vehicle at the time. So it'd be nice and up to temperature. It's, it will only do that if you're storing the vehicle during winter and you're not using it. Uh, and as I say, this one, the one behind it is just for everything beyond the boiler. You can just flick that up and down, up to drain, down to close. But I'll leave everything drained down for the time being. The final thing, or your final drain down point, is actually located on the outside of the vehicle, and it's your waste water tank. So as you can see, just right by the mains hookup cable, you can see there's a sticker. And underneath that, you've got the discharge pipe here, along with a metal bar or a metal rod. You'll have a little handle, which will be somewhere in the vehicle again, which will connect onto this. All you've got to do is turn that, and that will allow you to drain the entire tank into a large grid again on site. Now, unlike your fresh water and your boiler, they're actually located on the inside of the vehicle. This particular fresh uh, waste water tank isn't. This is actually under slung um, under the vehicle, as you can imagine. So what could potentially happen is if you're using the vehicle, that tank could potentially freeze, unlike the others, because they're on board. They'll only freeze if you freeze. But this tank could freeze. So the best thing to do I'd recommend is get a bucket, place that underneath for when you're using it and this i'm talking only do this in really cold conditions but let that leave that open so all the waste drains into a bucket that way you know it's not going to freeze and you've got peace of mind so that concludes the outside of the video uh, of the uh, handover video we're now going to jump on the inside uh, before we jump on the inside i would like to say i forgot to mention at the beginning of the video that this vehicle hasn't been valid as of yet i'm just wanting to uh, to get it uh, prepped and, and and this video done for you ready for your handover so if you can look past anything like that be much appreciated okie dokie so as we come through the habitation door uh, you can see that on the left hand side you've got a bracket for a tv along with all the necessary connections to power it and just above that you've got your main control panel along with your control panel for your heating so firstly going through your main control panel you've got your on off switch here that will turn on and off everything in the vehicle. That's your main isolator switch. Above, you've then got, it's a little bit difficult actually to see in the light, but you've got, well you can see it better like that, there you are. Uh, you've got a little battery that's located in what appears to be the back of a van. That is for your leisure battery level. Hold that and that will show you that at the moment we are 100% as we're plugged into electric. Underneath, you've got your vehicle battery level, hold that, can see it probably needs a little bit of a run but it's not far off 100 percent and that will tell you just on this side uh, and the little v stands for voltage on the other side you've then got very similar your fresh water level hold that as you can see we've not got anything in at the moment but if i did it would come up on this side and then your wastewater level you can see we've got a little bit in at the moment just reading 25 percent finally on here you've got your pump button Click that on to turn the pump on. Now, only turn the pump on when you've got water in the vehicle. Obviously, if you were to turn that on and leave it on for a prolonged time, eventually, if you had no water in the van, that is, it's going to burn out the pump. So only run that when you've got water in the tank. So when you're on site and you're filled up with water, turn that button on, go to all of your taps, including your shower, turn that on and turn it to hot. What that will do is it will pull fresh water from the fresh water tank into the boiler and then out of the tap. It will spurt and splutter initially, but then when it's running steadily, you've primed your system for your hot water. Once you've done that, flick it over to cold. Like I said, this goes for all of your taps. Uh, let it prime, so we'll let it spurt and splutter. And again, when it's running steadily, you've primed your system, you're away. Dead simple. Now, what I'd recommend is doing this as soon as you get in the vehicle. So as soon as you've filled up with water on site, if you prime the system, it will ensure that water is pulled through the boiler uh, and is ready to be used. Because as soon as you do that, you can then turn your heating on, which will then give that water an opportunity and a chance to heat up. Your heater in this is going to take approximately 30 minutes to to heat up the water depending on what fuel you're using as there's 10 liters that it can hold so bear that in mind um, but as i say do that the first thing uh, if that's the first thing you do it will just allow it to pull through top it up with water and then we'll give it a chance to heat so by the time you you've got everything sorted in the van it'll be ready to use 
Um, now, you can actually leave your pump on uh, once you've primed all your system because on each of your taps you've got something called a micro switch which will activate and deactivate the pump whenever you need it. So it's a little bit like at home, you know, you turn your tap on, water comes out, it's the same thing, it will activate your pump when you need it. The only time you need to turn that off is when you've got no water in the motorhome. Now next up is your control panel for your trimmer heating. So turning that on, I'm just going to turn this off for the time being, so there we are. So everything underneath the line is what you want to select. So firstly, you can see that you've got your vehicle's temperature. So you can go all the way up to 30 degrees should you want to. Next up, you've then got your water temperature. Uh, you can run this off eco, hot or boost. Eco is approximately 40 degrees. Hot is approximately 70 degrees. And boost will concentrate on rather than heating the vehicle itself, it will heat the water itself. Uh, solely the water uh, and it will just concentrate on heating that water and getting it up to temperature next up you've then got your fuel so on your fuel you can either run this off gas mix one which is a mixture of gas and one kilowatt electric mix two which is a mixture of gas and two kilowatt electric el1 which is purely one kilowatt electric and el2 which is just two kilowatt electric now, if you're on site, you're going to run it off EL2 nine times out of ten. If you're wild camping, you'll run it off gas. However, what might happen on certain sites, especially abroad, if you're plugged in, you may be limited with how much power you can use, so you may be forced to run this off EL1. If that is the case, a vehicle of this size is really going to struggle heat it, being heated off one kilowatt electric. So with that in mind, flick it over to mix two or purely just uh, sorry, mix one or purely just gas, and that will get it up to temperature a lot quicker. Gas is always a lot more efficient in getting it up to temperature, uh, as naturally it's more powerful than two, just two kilowatt electric. So if you find that the van is struggling, it needs to get up to temperature a bit quicker, stick it on gas. But it's really important that you select a fuel that you've got, for reasons I'm going to come to shortly. Next up, you've then got your fan button. So at the moment, it's only given the option of uh, vent, which will ventilate and recirculate the air in the vehicle. If I was to turn my fuel on, um, so if I just select this off EL1 for the time being, and if I go to my vehicle's temperature, I can then go onto the fan, and the fan will then allow me to select between eco or high. Uh, eco is obviously activating the fan and high is just a more intensified version of that next up underneath you've got a timer that you can actually set on this panel so if you wanted to you can actually set a time for when you want the control panel to come on so if you've been walking for the day and you want to come back to a nice warm van you can set that timer which is dead handy you've also got the time on here so you can change the time that's shown on the panel but then finally the main bit that you need to know is the settings panel the little spanner in the corner here click that and this will allow you to gain access to the settings the main thing that you need to know in here is the reset button now the reset will obviously reset the entire panel the reason you need to reset it is if you ever come across an error code an error code often comes about because you've selected something that you've not got so for example if i was to run this system off gas now because I've got no gas in the vehicle, I will get an error code because it's trying to fuel the boiler with something that it's not got. So it's protecting the boiler and it's faulting. If I get that error code on here, I then need to go into that settings panel. I need to reset it and then it will say reset, preset. Just uh, wait about 20 seconds and then the screen will start flickering and eventually it will come back on and it will look great. It will do that all in the span of about 30 to 40 seconds so it, and it will look perfectly fine but you do need to wait a full 20 minutes for that whole system to reset so just bear that in mind now the same goes for what you should always remember the same goes for when you're uh, say you're coming off site so i've finished on site now and if i was to run this off electric say um before removing the hookup cable on the outside of the van always remember to turn this off just like so by holding the button because in essence, if I was supposed, if I was to remove that hookup cable, this would then become, uh, this would then unfault. Because in essence, I've taken the fuel away from the control uh, from the boiler. So always turn that off before you remove the fuel. Because next time when you come to use it, you'll have an error code and you'll have to reset it, and it'll just be a pain. So just get into that habit. Now turning around, you can see that you've got your front dinette here. 
this table does remove just simply by lifting this up and pulling it away towards you and you can see you've got a double layered effect here just by pulling can't see here there we are sorry pulling that knob there that will then allow you to swing this across and allow someone sitting here to obviously eat now underneath this seat you've actually got a little bit of storage well you can see underneath there which is quite handy underneath these two front seats you haven't got any storage just so you know because this is where your boiler is located as well as your fresh water tank which can be accessed in that convenience locker i've shown you you've then got your drop down bed above this dinette area with cupboards which are all located here now in this cupboard you will notice that you've got a plastic box here and you can see you've got a little bit of the mechanism from the motor that is uh, that's just exposed that is where the manual override is for the drop down bed so somewhere in the vehicle again you'll have a long um, uh, hexagon nut which just slots into there and you can wind the bed up and down should there be any issues with the motor now what tends to happen with these beds the, the majority of issues we get tends to be when you've when you've blown a fuse and all that all that's needed is just take some spare fuses with you you can then go to the front here um, and then replace the fuse and then you're good to go that tends to be what happens however if not you have always got that manual override so you'll never be stuck with it up or down uh, that brings me on to the bed itself to operate this turn that key and then press that button and then you can drop the bed and let it drop into position uh, one thing i'd recommend is just pulling this off here like so laying that flat that will just allow the bed to drop down to its lowest position as you can see that slots into position like so stops automatically and then you'll just need two ladder uh, just a set of ladders rather to jump up to your bed you've got your reading lights in the roof there and all your bedding can stay on here just with your bedding be careful how thick it is because some customers have put really high and thick bedding on here which eventually when you take it up it presses against the ceiling and it can cause uh, you the bed to blow a fuse so just bear that in mind uh, but any bedding the majority of the time providing it's flat can stay on with your pillows stick them at the front but everything is good to go and when you're ready click that button and up it goes and it will stop automatically when it's at the top before moving out the lounge as well you'll notice in all your windows you have got blackout blinds and fly screens as well which just pull down the windows all open as well like so by releasing these brackets and then they click into place and allow you to hold it into position just like that so bring it all the way down press all the way up and it will free the window you can also put these windows on venting like so just to allow a little bit of airflow through the vehicle however please ensure when traveling these windows are all sealed like so it will just ensure that no wind gets underneath it which could potentially rip the window off the same goes for your skylights throughout the motorhome as well you want to ensure that these are all sealed correctly your skylights have also got blackout blinds and fly screens and to open this particular one press this in and slide the skylight handle back but again make sure that that is nice and sealed lock it in for when you're traveling moving into the kitchen area we've spoken obviously about priming your system uh, in your top drawer here you have got access to these valves here these are uh, protection uh, gas protection uh, safety valves otherwise known as isolation valves and they will allow you to isolate certain areas of the vehicle now don't worry about this you don't need to really use these these are really designed for um, the technicians when working on the vehicle and when we're fault finding uh, on certain appliances so everything you need to know is on this panel above as discussed uh, so you can just leave that there you don't need to uh, play around with them you've then got your hob which is here three gas hobs uh, and then underneath you've got your oven and grill above you've actually got a, uh, an extractor fan fitted to this click that on to turn the extractor on and above there you've got a really good bit of storage now under the oven and grill you've actually got your rcd breaker opening this up is where all your trip switches are 
If the vehicle ever trips, you can simply come to this position here. Nice and accessible. And that slots in just like so. Obviously, when traveling, just make sure all your cupboards um, are locked into position. Uh, moving on, you've then got, as you can see, uh, a little bit of storage up here, along with a 230 volt socket that's been fitted for a future microwave should you need it. And then underneath, you've got your Dometic fridge. So I've just turned your Dometic fridge on. You do that by just holding this button here, and you can see that the power button activates everything. You've then got the mode with button here. Hold this to then switch through the available options. Now I'm going to leave this on auto. The auto uh, function automatically assigns whichever fuel you've got supplied to the fridge on um, uh, up to basically power the fridge. So it's really easy. So leave it on auto. You can see we're plugged into electric at the moment. So it's automatically found that we are plugged into electric. So it's now running the fridge off 230 volt electric. You can knock this off, of course, and do it manually. But I find you might you may as well leave it on auto. Now the three options are you can either run it off 12 volt ledger battery, uh, your gas, which as indicated by the flame, or your 230 volt electric, as indicated by the plug, which we're currently on. When you're on site, more often than not, you'll run it off your 230 volt electric. When you're wild camping, you'll run it off your gas. And then when you're traveling with your ignition on, you'll run it off your 12 volt ledger battery. Now, a lot of customers think that they can run the fridge off the 12 volt leisure battery if they're stationary that unfortunately isn't the case um, if that was the case your leisure battery would just be completely out of power so with that in mind ensure that the ignition is turned on because this particular vehicle is fitted with an alternator which will send power from the vehicle battery into the leisure battery which will then power up the fridge so it's dead easy so it'll only work your 12 volt when your ignition is on and then when you're wild camping of course you can run it off your gas finally you have got a little thermometer button here so you can change the temperature of the fridge and if you was to uh, for example select this and put it onto uh, a fuel that you hadn't got if you caught it and you took it away from auto uh, you get a little error symbol on here which will allow you to reset the fridge I'm going to turn that off now because there's no need for it. Just hold that and you can see that's where the lights come off. And on the fridge itself, you've got a lock button here, which we can obviously unlock and lock for when you're traveling. Your freezer's up at the top and fridge is just below. Now, whilst I'm in the kitchen area, throughout the vehicle, you have got a double height floor. You can actually access this. Just excuse the floor, as I say, it's not been cleaned yet. Um, but opening up the hatch will gain you access to the underfloor storage, which is really handy. Uh, this is a really good point to put your shoes in there. Obviously it means they're out the way and that cavity is fully heated and insulated just like the garage. Directly opposite the kitchen area, you can see that you've got your bathroom. Now we've spoken again about priming your system for your shower, your tap, so you're all right with that. The main thing that I need to talk you through is obviously the toilet. Now I kept on mentioning the blade on the toilet, that the blade needs to be closed uh, when emptying. The blade is this piece of plastic here. Pull it towards you to open it, push it away from you to close it. Now when in use, you need to slide that across to open the blade so all the waste can drop into the cassette. Once you've done that, click the blue button, which is up at the top there. That will activate your flush and flush out the entire system into the cassette. Once you've done that, close the blade. You close the blade for two reasons. The main reason being is it it stops odors from escaping, but obviously too, it just gets you into the habit of having that closed. So when you come to remove the cassette, it's good to go. Uh, and you're not gonna run into the issue of it jamming. Now above there, as I mentioned, the blue button will activate your flush. You do need your pump on for that to operate. And when the cassette is full, you'll get a little red light on this indicator panel here, just to indicate that you need to, of course, empty it. Uh, just to point out a couple hidden bits, you've also got socket here, um, sorry, a light switch there and a socket just next to it, which is for your 230 volt appliances. Moving to the rear of the vehicle, uh, on the one side here, you've got your controls for the drop down bed. So you've got an additional drop down bed as this is a 745 model, you have a rear lounge and an island drop down bed. To operate this, Again, it's very similar. You just need to remove these back cushions. I tend to slot these down. You just convert the table like so. 
just like that. This acts as the base for the bed and then you can select the button. As you can see, when we're all prepped, click this button, oh, turn the key first. There we are, and that will allow you to drop the bed all the way down. And you can see it makes for a huge bed. As I mentioned, all your bedding can stay on. Again, just put with your pillows, stick them elsewhere, and then you are good to go. Now, moving back uh, to this control panel, so we've spoken about this. You've also got your lights up here and a blanking socket here if you ever wanted a 230 volt socket fitting. This particular vehicle, as I mentioned, is fitted with uh, the uh, gas regulator, which will allow you to automatically turn it on or off, depending on obviously your situation and whether you've got gas. Now, this will light up green if you've got gas supplied to the vehicle. This will, as you can see, light up amber if you've no gas supplied to the vehicle. Um, so just bear that in mind. Uh, if it does light up amber, it's probably indicating that you're running out of gas and you need to fill up with gas. So just bear that in mind. Um, but you can just do that from here. Obviously, you'll need to ensure that this is turned on as well as your bottles being turned on for any gas appliances to be worked on in the vehicle. Um, that is just specific to this particular vehicle I'm filming, as well as this. Uh, now, as I mentioned on the outside, the majority of vehicles don't have a heated waste water tank. However, this one does. Um, so what you're going to do, flick that on, and that will heat that waste water tank. So you don't have to worry about putting a bucket underneath. You can just click that, and that will keep it nice and warm. In very cool climates, I mean, I'm talking extreme cool conditions, uh, as well as heating it, you may want to keep it open as well. Um, but I am talking, obviously, very extreme weather conditions there. Next up, moving it back into the lounge, you can see you've got a really good bit of storage in here. And we've also fitted a 5G router in this motorhome. I'm going to show you how this operates on the day. Uh, please bring a SIM card uh, and I will operate, I will get that in the back there and set this all up for you. And then moving back round, you can see you've got two 30 volt socket here, along with some light switches and more storage. So a bit of hanging space in there. And if I jump onto the other side, you can see you've got the same again. Finally in the back, You've got your TV bracket, which is just in there, along with your necessary uh, plug-in points to watch the telly and power it. Now, the final bit that I've not mentioned in this vehicle is, of course, the Teleco Aircon unit. So you can see the Aircon unit is currently powered off, um, but because we're plugged in, it is indicating that it is getting a charge. Now, to operate this, all you've got to do is use this handy remote here. On the remote, if I click on, you'll notice that you get a green light. And you can see that this is now beginning to put out quite a lot of air. I don't know whether you can hear me too well, so I'm just gonna turn that off. But it's just as simple as turning it on and off, and that will activate uh, the aircon. Next to that on the control is the fan button so you can change the speed of the fan should you want to and also next to that you can lower and in increase and lower the temperature through these two arrows. You've actually got a torch embedded into this so if it's a dark night uh, you can see around the vehicle which is quite handy and then you've got a difference of, ch uh, of mode as well. Uh, if you wanted as well, uh, you have got a time button here so a little bit like the heating you can turn this on and off at a certain time should you need to. And you can also um, set, as I say, uh, various uh, various modes to for it to come on and off during certain points of the day. I can show you more of that on handover, but the majority of that um, is all done through the remote. It's a really good system, actually. Really clever. Please ensure, however, that this will only work when you are plugged into 230 volt electric. This will not work when you are uh, on site and wild camping. Uh, you have to be plugged into a 230 volt mains connection. And that concludes the handover video on this personal Azeo TD745. I hope you enjoyed.